Hi everybody, welcome back to Psychedelics Today. I'm joined today by famed, uh, I guess, cannabis activist, now now a bit of a psychedelic activist, uh, Peter Grinspoon, MD out of uh, Harvard MGH. How are you doing today? Doing really good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Really excited. Um, I've been following you on uh, socials for years now and always impressed by your awesome commentary and and great insight into this kind of drug science, drug policy situation we find ourselves in. So. Well, thank you. I mean, it's fair to say I've been involved in it since like birth. So I, I do have a long vantage point. <laughs> so. Well, let's describe that, right? So your father was a very influential figure, at least around cannabis. Can you tell me um, what his work was looking like? Sure. Well, my dad um, went in 19, like 1969, 1970 to write a book about cannabis. He's a psychiatrist at Harvard. He was like thinking, what are all these young people doing? They're probably hurting themselves. And he wanted to write a very comprehensive book. And he went and did a very, very, very deep dive into literally everything that was written about cannabis. And he came out with a book in 1971, which was very controversial, very popular. It was called Marijuana Reconsidered. It was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review. And it, 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 it um, you know, it acknowledged harms of cannabis, of course, teenagers, uh, you know, pregnant women, people with a history of psychosis, just like we acknowledge today. But it also argued very strongly that uh, criminalizing cannabis is far, far more harmful than actually using cannabis. So he it really provided a lot of intellectual firepower um, for the for the cannabis legalization movement. When he when it came out, when his book Marijuana Reconsider came out, about twelve percent of people. Uh, supported full legalization of cannabis. And now it's about 69%, it, 70% actually. It went up about a point for every of the fi- each of the 50 years that my dad worked on it. So he was really, uh, really influential. He, I, I could also have a good story about my dad and psychedelics if you're interested. <laughs> so. Yeah, let's do that as well. That sounds great. Well, in 1979, right, uh, 43 years ago, my dad wrote a book called Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered, which is a great book. He, he followed by a Another book called Psychedelic Reflections, a lot of um, uh, just uh, stories of how people benefited from psychedelics. So I added two books on psychedelics. And in 1979, he was calling, yelling from the rooftops for the use of cannabis, the use of psychedelics in psychiatry and for the study of psychedelics in psychiatry. But as usual, my dad was like way ahead of his time. So he got sort of crucified by Harvard Medical. They never promoted him to full professor despite you know, 11 books, 180 scientific papers because of his book on psychedelics. They told him they just don't like it at all. And now we have this wonderful center at MGH for psychedelic medicine. Uh, you know, you and I were talking before the show about all the great people that that work there. So it's just very ironic that my dad got sort of persecuted for for calling for the study and use of psychedelics in 1979 when actually that's and now like 90% of psychiatrists are in favor of it. Mm, I love that. And uh, being in Harvard MGH at that period of time, did you personally ever bump into uh, John Mack, Harvard psychiatrist? John Mack was a fixture of my childhood because he was one of my dad's best friends. My dad's two best friends each won Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, His first best friend was Carl Sagan, who won a Pulitzer Prize for The Dragons of Eden, which is a mind-blowing book. And John Mack won a Pulitzer Prize for um, a psychoanalytic biography of Lawrence of Arabia, a prince of our discontent or something. Great book. John Mack is, was really, really charismatic. I loved it when he came over. And in fact, uh, me and my twin brother are very close friends of the son, Kenny Mack. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And how, how interesting Carl Sagan and Mack, they're so like different. Um, well, I have so an interesting story about that too. When John Mack sort of got derailed about 10 years uh, before the end of his life and started believing, Steve, he was studying patients who were having UFO experiences and then he started sort of believing them. Uh, my dad got Carl Mack and uh, John Mack and Carl Sagan together so that Carl can convince John that, you know, UFOs aren't actually real. And apparently it got very heated and John Mack yelled at Carl Sagan, you're being too Cartesian. So it kind of, um, <laughs> I had a very weird childhood. I mean, all these people were like smoking pot frequently in my in my house when I was growing up, and I and I grew to associate sort of uh, cannabis with like intellectual discussion and like very motivated people. I had a very different experience with it than than I think it's fair to say most people did. 
Oh, right. Yeah. You're being in that kind of intellectual, medical, philosophical environment. You know, just the fact that you had heard that line, you're being too Cartesian. Like that's, well, I that's always a special of listening line. at the edge of the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, if I went too close, my dad would be like time for bed. So I was always listening to, to, to these, all these guys and all these other academics and intellectuals. It was really fun in our living room. It was very, very inspiring. I mean, it was, it was amazing. Like, and you know, they're all passing the peace pipe around and they're not just talking about saving the world. They're actually saving the world. They're actually trying to fix things. And doing thing, a nuclear test ban, which my dad and Carl Sagan worked on. And then you go to school in middle school, grade school, and uh, high school, and you go to the D.A.R.E. program, and these, the same policemen waddle in year after year, and they're like, marijuana makes you amotivational, and it seems like they barely had enough gumption to get back to Dunkin' Donuts, whereas at home, I saw these people using cannabis who were like the most motivated people I'd ever seen. It was like so mm -hmm. inspiring that um, I really didn't buy the amotivational syndrome very. I actually have a pretty recent blog on my Substack, stack uh, taking down the amotivational syndrome, but I, I haven't been a believer in the amotivational syndrome since uh, my early teens. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. I just, I haven't really seen it in my, in my own personal experience and I've been around quite a bit of cannabis for, for quite a long time. So I guess, um, yeah, let's talk about your kind of path. So you, I assume you, you were around this stuff before even enrolling in an undergrad. So like, what did you, did you know you wanted to get into medicine? Was cannabis like kind of always on your mind or how did, how did your path kind of work out? There's another component that I do have to mention, which that my brother Danny fought a losing battle with leukemia and he died when I was about eight, but my parents did by him, get him, procure him cannabis to use. And I just watched my brother Danny and when he used cannabis, he can like, when he didn't use cannabis, he was just alone in his room, like barfing into a bucket by the side of the bed. And when he used cannabis uh, with the chemotherapy, he could eat, hold down food. And, and most importantly to us, play with his boisterous little twin brothers. So not only did I associate cannabis with like intellectual, you know, sort of, sort of momentum and energy and, and also like a lot of good humor, I, I came to associate it with healing. And I always wanted to be a healer. I, in college, I was a philosophy major. And then, you know, my family was always very political. So I thought I had to do something. So I spent five years between college and medical school working for Greenpeace, you know, like going to Chernobyl with a little Geiger counter and chasing after nuclear submarines. So I had a very intense time for the five years after college. And then I went to medical school and, uh, you know, it's hard being a doctor, but it's really in a lot of other ways, very wonderful. It's, it's, you know, it gives you, if people listen to you, I mean, and they, they do and they don't, but you know, my views on drugs are, are, are different than that of like the average doctor. I, I personally think I'm where most doctor is going to be in 10 years, but you know, something like addiction, you know, the other thing I should mention is I am 15 years in recovery from an opiate addiction. And while I wouldn't put get addicted, ruin your life, get better and then help other doctors and then help other people on the medical school curriculum. It, it really gives you such a profound understanding of addiction. Um, there, there's no substitute for lived experience. So um, you know, now with like cannabis and with psychedelics, I'm so interested in how we could treat people for, for addiction. And, you know, we're fighting against this, this ideology that we've adopted largely from Alcoholics Anonymous um, in the 1930s that, you know, Abstinence for life is the only path, but I'm a huge believer in using cannabis and psychedelics and having a big tent to welcome anybody who's trying to get into recovery, not like drug testing them and kicking them out if they use cannabis or psychedelics or even Suboxone. You go to these Narcotics Anonymous meetings and some people say, oh, you're on Suboxone, you're not really in recovery. So, um, you know, I just, my path is, has led me to have sort of different views than I think your average doctor, but you know, obviously I think I'm right or I wouldn't have these views. <laughs> so, but it's always been fun, like debating and talking and speaking and stuff like that. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I guess before we move m further, you know, you're also, you know, not only was Carl Sagan trying to save the world, John Mack was also doing a lot of anti-nuclear proliferation talks and Middle Eastern peace talks and helping negotiate really powerful people, which is really incredible too. What, like what a foundation for you to have as a young person. No, absolutely. And Andy Weil and Rick Doblin and Ellen Ginsberg. I mean, it was just, I was so spoiled. I mean, I wasn't spoiled in the fact that my brother died from cancer. That was very traumatic. But aside from that, I was really, really spoiled in having like, you've never, you can never find someone who had a more inspiring uh, sort of upbringing. And I really am grateful for that. And I really appreciate that. 
So I guess, yeah, I keep saying, but yeah, let's, let's hold on. Let's do another one. So Rick Doblin and your father actually helped sue the government. Can you, can you talk about that scene? Yeah, they, you know, Rick Doblin, I remember him visiting us. My dad had this pool that he never heated and we, the vacuum didn't really work. So it was more like swimming in a lake or pond. Uh, but I remember Rick Doblin swimming when I, in the, as a childhood. Rick is such a wonderful, fantastic person. And I just remember my dad and him like working really hard. I believe, I could be wrong, I was young and then I was off at college. But I, in the 80s, I, I remember they actually sued the government and I thought they temporarily won to open up. Uh, the use of MDMA for for psychotherapy. My dad was convinced that it would really help couples. My dad was a psychiatrist, and it's just really amazing having done MDMA on several several occasions. Like, what is so scary about it? I mean, like any drug, it can have a bad effect. People can have a bad reaction. There are certain people that probably should stay away from it, just like cannabis or penicillin or or Zoloft. Any drugs have their pros and their cons, and I I just don't get why these things are are criminalized. It's like the wrong approach. And, and I think that was like drummed into me re- at a really early age because my dad and, you know, these other heroes of the, of the, you know, I don't know what to call it, the psychedelic movement or the cannabis movement were always like suing the government. So, um, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. And I, I wore the Doblin shirt just for everybody <laughs> to get to see that on YouTube. Um, cool. So, you know, uh, when you were going through your medical school, it's good to have philosophy as a background in your undergrad. I have the same. Um, Never hurts, like, right? <laughs> no, it's so helpful to like learn how to think at the very least. Um, and how to, and how, to, and how mm-hmm. to debate, actually. You know, right. really, debate in yeah. a friendly way, but it really helps. Yeah, I wish I had more of that, but <laughs> I try. So medical school, was it like challenging for you as you're hearing your professors kind of have one narrative around drugs of abuse and then your kind of lived experience being a little different, or how did you experience that? Yeah, it was that? very alienating. I went to Boston University School of Medicine, and then I've been I've been at Harvard for the last twenty five years. And you know what they taught about cannabis and other drugs was like pretty much straight from the DEA, and it just was like nonsense. And you know I found it really really uh, frustrating. I the same was true in internship and in residency. Uh, things are getting better now a little bit. Now like you could hear two sides of the story, not just one side. Um, you know, but back then the psychiatrists were all completely against psych- psychedelics and, and people were not at all in favor of medical cannabis. I did my senior presentation as a resident on medical cannabis in the year 2000, uh, 23 years ago. And everybody thought it was so eccentric and they thought that this was like the latest fad, like, you know, beta carotene or omega three, whatever. And now it's, it's fun because the same patients are re- the same doctors who thought I was eccentric are referring patients to me. So it's pretty cool. That's amazing. Wow. That's really interesting. So uh, like cannabis science was has always been a little bit immature because of the drug war. We're not getting kind of appropriate science funding. Well, not only that, but the federal monopoly on cannabis manufacture for a long time that Sue Sicily and a few others finally broke. Um, like what what was the data you were working with at that point in like the early days? Like uh well, a lot of anecdotal evidence, you know, my dad wrote the book, Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine in 1993, which really helped pave the way to legalize medical cannabis in, in California in 1996. And, you know, there was a, a lot of anecdotes, a lot of, a lot of listening to patients that Carl Sagan dubbed it an N of one study, a number of one study. But, um, you know, my dad wrote in that book, it's very moving, like in the absence of good data, what we have to do is something that doctors used to do for a very long time that we've sort of lost touch with. Let's actually listen to what our patients are saying. And that really moved me. I mean, that really, really affected how I've been a doctor ever since. Yeah, I mean, you try to listen, like, you know, if you're an hour behind and someone's having a heart attack and, you know, <laughs> it's like everything's in chaos and the computer's frozen, you, you don't listen as well, but you do your best to listen. So. <laughs> Yeah, I did 20 years in software, and I know the software thing so well. I used to do some work with the, those big platforms, and I'm like, I don't know if I could like rely on this as my, as an individual. Never mind, like trying to save somebody's life and having to deal with these. Computers yeah, no. When the, the computer stops, we stop. I think the hospitals have paper backups and like some kind of, I don't know, old fashioned medieval system of like signs <laughs> and symbols. But it, without the computer, we're just dead in the water. It's really weird. I mean, it's amazing how the computer helps, and it's also amazing how you spend all your time on the computer and you spend less and less time actually talking to people every year. So it's, it's really, it's a double-edged sword, the computers. Yeah. I think in time we're going to get better. I think a lot of, uh, 
company I was with does a lot of medical transcription work and real-time medical transcription work for getting stuff into those systems. So I imagine in time with sorted AI tools, it'll be a lot more robust and there'll be a lot more human, I would imagine, yeah, in so a couple one, of years. One big problem is that we have like a warning, fati- alert fatigue. Like mm. everything I do on the computer, there's an alert because there could be a hypothetical interaction. And it really should alert me only when I'm making a mistake, like you're prescribing penicillin for someone who's allergic. So we get like an alert every single time we click the computer and we ignore all of them or we'd be working up 29 hours a day. And it's, that's a very dangerous situation. I know we're getting a little off track, but it's really a weird, weird system. Yeah. Well, you know, this is a good thing for people in the psychedelic space to hear because people are developing software for the space, right? And like there are problems in the traditional medical software world. So learn, you know, ask questions. I think we can just keep improving here, everybody, and, you know, well, learn. Well, one problem is that like until a couple of years ago, the only way to put cannabis use in the computer was marijuana abuse or marijuana addiction. And that that's a perfect example of like totally skewing the research in sort of a drug worry way towards the negative. And now we lobbied in our, our computer system. We could put medical cannabis user, cannabis user, like, use non-stigmatizing language. And I think we're going to have to really develop a way to communicate that we're treating people with psychedelics. It doesn't get into the like, you know, hallucinogen use disorder, blah, blah, blah. We've got, like, which happens in a very small fraction of people. But there needs to be like a normative way of, uh, of discussing psychedelics in the medical record system. And I'll bet if I looked right now, there wouldn't be diagnoses. Uh, for like, you know, ketamine assisted therapy and so forth. So it is a really important point actually. Yeah. So, so how about this? So I, um, I'm a frequent cannabis user daily. I, um, have ketamine prescribed to me. I rarely, you know, only once ever, but it's always on the chart. And then, you know, I, I have a relatively robust drug use history and, and current, but you know, I, I take breaks. I think I'm doing it in a healthy way, but I'm afraid to actually talk to physicians about, my situation oh. because you know i i'm very literally would love to be able to be honest but i think there's so many incentives against me being honest but like what are you what are your thoughts on that kind of thing that, honestly it shut me up if i go on too long that's one of my biggest pet peeves like on planet earth um i have a whole chapter in my recent book seeing through the smoke about cannabis you know doctors are supposed to do no harm and chapter four is called do be no harm And it's about how the doctors were just on the wrong side of the war on drugs from the beginning to the end. And they they still are. I I wrote in this piece for Harvard Health that was very well received. Like no matter what a doctor thinks personally about cannabis, whether they're pro, whether they're anti, whether they're neutral, whether they don't feel comfortable talking about it or know much about it, they need to create a safe and comfortable climate for their patients to talk to them about it. Or what's going to happen is the patients are going to clam up. And then what you get is you get two parallel systems of care that don't communicate. Like I have a lot of patients in my private practice that I prescribe medical cannabis to who said to me exactly what you said. I didn't feel comfortable at all talking to my doctor or I talked to my psychiatrist and he shut down the discussion. He or she shut down the discussion right away. Mm. And, you know, not just with cannabis, but with all drugs, we're actually killing people by making them feel judged and stigmatized and not, um, help ha, helping them feel comfortable communicating with us. Um, you know, if people can't talk about like my drinking is getting out of control. My opiate use is getting out of control. I'm using my sleeping pills too much. We're really, really harming them. So I think it's absolutely critical that we do better and that doctors find a way to communicate comfortably with patients, even if they don't necessarily agree with it. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. I, I feel mean spirited sometimes saying things like that. Because I'm not a physician, I don't know all the pressures. Oh, yeah, so many people go through this. I, I, mm-hmm. I th- two to three times a day, somebody complains to me about exactly that, and I, I just think doctors could do a lot better. And it's also really funny. Like ninety percent of psychiatrists now support the use of psychedelics. Why are they still so far behind in cannabis? I just don't get it. It's I, I, I put through like five theories in my book which we could discuss if you want, but it's really <laughs> funny how like with cannabis, they were like, oh, golly gee, that's illegal. We can't use that. And with psychedelics, they're like, hey, let's do some mushrooms and turn on and do some therapy. It's it's such a double standard. It blows my mind to shreds. Well, yeah, let's dig into that. Is it just like fear of tie-dye or like what, what do people... Well, well, one friend told me that they thought cannabis, the psychiatrist thought cannabis is more like Valium, something you have to keep taking and the psychedelics uh, were more curative. So the more interesting and more exciting. 
another theory is that yes, there is, is more. Well, there is and isn't. There is more data in the form that doctors like to see about psychedelics than about cannabis because the war on drugs distorted all the research on cannabis and give them a profoundly negative view of it. And again, they were all on the wrong side of the war on drugs, so they never learned about the benefits. Uh, one is just cannabis paved the way for psychedelics, and and one is like the white drug black drug thing, you know, the whole psychedelic exceptionalism thing. So there are a lot of different theories, but I just think it's like, first of all, cannabis is a psychedelic. Anybody who's taken an edible that's a little bit stronger than they wanted to, you close your eyes and you're seeing things just like when you take mushrooms. So cannabis is a psychedelic. So I just don't get why there's such a double standard. That's another one of my pet peeves. You keep um, walking right into all my pet peeves here today. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Um, at what point did you feel compelled to start writing on this topic? Well, I've always written. I wrote a writ. I started keeping a diary at age 15. I mean, I've written every day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, during my addiction, I just said, you know, this is awful. This derailed me. I didn't realize that doctors get very stigmatized and, and criticized and get consumed by guilt and shame. And whereas all other doctors clam up about their addiction, I said, hey, why don't I write a memoir? and tell the world and say, we should treat doctors with empathy and compassion like everybody else because we have higher addiction rates than everybody else. We have all the the stress of being doctors and then we have all the stresses that the rest of us have of like, you know, sick parents, sick kids, money problems, you know, marital problems, divorce. So doctors really need a lot more care and empathy. We have one of the highest, if not the highest suicide rate in any profession. And so I wrote about my my addiction. And that made me, I've been writing about it ever since for Harvard Health and on my Substack and my latest book is about cannabis. I just love writing. And I just think there's so much to tell, like about Kelly Sober. I had a recent piece about Kelly Sober. I had a recent piece, Do Be No Harm, about, again, how doctors were on the wrong side of the war on drugs. And I had a recent piece in time saying we should decriminalize opiates because it's just the illegal purchase of opiates is killing people. If you legalize opiates and maybe you had like a government store handing them out or selling them, nobody would be over- overdosing of fentanyl if they wouldn't have to procure them illegally. So I've been involved with the, the drug issue again my, my entire life and I've been writing my entire life and that's what I like to write about. <laughs> so that's I don't amazing. know if that answered your question, but. Yeah. So thank yeah, thanks for that. So um, let's talk a little bit more about seeing through the smoke. Um, so like what's the, what's the overall thesis there? What, what were you trying to accomplish? Oh, well, I just want to tell the truth about cannabis. I, no one's really written a book that, that totally tells the truth about it since my dad's book in 1991, 1971, Marijuana Reconsidered, I think. I, I tend to think the books tend to be like, it has no harm or it's the satanic weed. They're on, on both extremes. So the first part of my book, I go through the social history. I have a chapter on the war on cannabis users, what we've actually done to cannabis users over the last 50 years, 20 million arrests, not for nonviolent possession of cannabis, mostly black and brown people. And this really affects your employment, your student loans, your education, your, your, it's just off your housing. Um, So the first part is about the social history of cannabis and how we got to where we are. The second part is about harms, real and imagined. And there are some very real harms. I go over with the latest science, why it can destabilize people with psychosis, why we don't know that it's safe in pregnancy, why it might harm teenage brains. So this is not a entirely pro-cannabis book. It talks about people who shouldn't use cannabis or if they use cannabis should be very, very careful. Then the third part is about all the benefits. And I just let loose about all the medical benefits. But I also talk about what isn't a benefit. I mean, if you have cancer, I mean, cannabinoids have been shown to kill cancer in the lab, but never in humans. If you have cancer, you get an oncologist and use cannabis for the symptoms of the chemotherapy of the cancer, like my brother Danny did 50 years ago. So I debunk a lot of the myths, both pro and anti. And then the final chapter is about lifestyle uses wellness, creativity, and enhancement. And, you know, that's where you, until very recently, you would get crucified as a doctor. You say anything positive about cannabis and it's like, oh, you're promoting drug use. And it's like, you're not promoting drug use. You're just telling the whole truth. Like when I go to a barbecue and I decide whether or not to drink, I don't really drink very much because I don't really find it a very interesting drug. But, you know, I know the pros and the cons. I know that it can make me happy and relax, but it also can be bad for my liver and causes cancer. Like you have to have the pros and the cons 
of cannabis or you can't make an informed decision. So Seeing Through the Smoke, I would argue, is the most comprehensive and balanced book that goes through the harms, the benefits, and the social history and the lifestyle enhancement uses. It's pretty pretty panoramic. Mm, I love that. And the mean-spirited thing that I mentioned earlier, I wanted to expand on that a little bit. I think I got this from Carl Hart, who is um, a pretty, pretty incredible individual himself. I, and this is why I feel bad. I say things like, um, you know, the medical establishment, including physicians, are are often another arm of the drug war. Oh, um, I just found out today, thera- or this past weekend, that in some cases, people are mandatory reporters around certain kinds of drug use. That's crazy. No, it's awful. I, if you read my chapter, Do Be No Harm, You'll Be Up in Arms. I mean, it's awful. It's worse than you think. And, you know, I, I just tweeted a story a couple of days ago, like they're separating this woman, of course, a black woman from her child because of cannabis use. And like separating the mom from the child is like a trillion times worse than the woman using cannabis. It's absolutely awful. And whatever doctor reported that, like she, I think should have the license taken away. And it, so it's really, really terrible. I I agree with you about that. Um, you know, what what is interesting is that a particular doctor, in my experiences, perspective on cannabis depends a little bit on his or her vantage point. For example, oncologists, like 90% of them I've seen studies are in favor of medical cannabis because their patients are like my brother Danny's. They do better. They feel better. They maintain their weight. They can eat. Whereas on the other extreme is like the addiction psychiatrist or the pediatric psychiatrist who, who see the the rare but genuine and tragic cases of cannabis destabilizing a young person and worsening their psychosis. But they tend to overgeneralize and think that happens to everybody, and they tend to be very anti-cannabis. I think the addiction people have been horrible about cannabis. They've been the worst of all of them and the psychiatrists. But I agree with you. But I, I do want to mention that like the the poll I saw is like two-thirds of doctors about think cannabis is a is a legitimate medicine and it's growing every year. They just, they haven't heard, as we talked about before, both sides of the story. And when they, when they hear both sides of the story, they're going to become much more pro. And then the final thing I want to say is that someone who's been prescribing medical cannabis for a quarter of a century, it makes me sound old, is that it makes my life a lot easier. What I do as a primary care doctor is I treat these like impossible to treat conditions like anxiety, insomnia, and chronic pain. What are you going to get for pain? Nobody wants opiates. Tylenol doesn't do anything. And the non-steroidals kill your kidneys. They they cause bleeding ulcers. They cause 10,000 heart attacks a year. Give them CBD with a little bit of THC. And a lot of times they do fine. Not if they have like super severe pain, but for the mild to moderate pain that people get as they get older and portlier and their hips and knees and backs start to go. So I actually find that having cannabis in my toolbox makes my life as a primary care doctor a lot easier. And when I think when the other doctors realize that and they see how well patients do, most patients, not everybody, and they see how well how you know how well it works, uh, they're going to be ad- adopting it a lot more quickly. And then I think it's going to be a lot easier to talk to people, to talk to physicians about cannabis. Yeah, I love that. Um, and thanks for explaining. It's, um, yeah, I know, I know physicians are doing the best they can with the evidence they have. Right. So I think hearing something like this, physicians, please like take the opportunity to learn more so that you to can learn more and to be humble. I talk a lot in my book about humility and, and, and to listen to patients. It, it really goes a long way. Patients really, really appreciate it. Right. Right. I had a, a visit with a new uh, prospective primary care person recently. And it was actually an enlightening, helpful conversation. Um, yeah, and I did disclose primary some care things. Doctor. Primary care doctors are endangered species these days. Nobody can find them. So I'm glad you mm. found one. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We, we need those. <laughs> I need, you need I need a need doctor. Them. If you don't have a primary care doctor, the medical establishment is just this like cold, unavailable system with nobody to advocate for you. You get lost in it. You absolutely need a primary care doctor. Yeah, absolutely. My alternative before was I, I had one, but I had like, I had software money at the time. <laughs> so I was able to play for like a really impressive plan. So I could just engage with whoever I wanted to, which was amazing. Um, yeah, now I'm on the other side of that. And it's such a weird scene relative to what I had before. Uh, it's fair to say that it's broken and getting worse. So as, as a primary care doctor, I've had a front row view to the like decline in primary care for the last 25 years. And like without primary care, nothing else works. 
like it, it loses money. But so what? You don't get any of the other care if you don't have a primary care doctor. Instead of like me treating your cough for like $100 in the clinic, you have to go to the emergency room and spend $2,000. It just, the whole system doesn't work without primary care doctors. What, um, what do you think is happening at the AMA in terms of resistance or support for issues like this, psychedelics and cannabis in particular? Well, let's keep in mind that the membership of the AMA has gone from about 80% of American doctors to about 12 to 15% of American wow. doctors. They have such conservative and boneheaded views on all of this stuff. It's really awful. They've been completely against legalization from the beginning. Ironically, when they when they criminalized cannabis in 1937, the AMA was arguing in favor of keeping it legal because doctors used to prescribe it back then in 1937. But, you know, they just went along with the war on drugs. Again, I talk a ton about this in my book, Seeing Through the Smoke. And they just, and now they're talking about like, we shouldn't criminalize people and arrest people, but then they're still against legalization. And like, how can you be like, in such an incoherent position? And they still put medical marijuana in these like derogatory quotation marks. And and part of it's that they're so conflicted by all the money they get from big pharma. And part of this just is like really the most conservative doctors are the ones that belong to the AMA. As you could probably tell, I am not a huge fan. Now, they tend to be followers, not leaders. And given that 90% of psychiatrists support psych- the use of psychedelics, the AMA, I'm, I'm going to predict, is not going to be particularly against that. But they've been just unhelpful and against legalization in every single ballot initiative. And um, I just wish there were physician groups that that actually uh, were more in line with what people actually believe. I mean, 94% of Americans support legal access to medical cannabis at this point, you know, 70% to recreational, but 90, who's against medical marijuana? I mean, come on, someone's dying of cancer, give them some medical marijuana. And again, the AMA still puts it in derogatory quotation marks. So does the American Psychiatric Association. They put medical marijuana in these derogatory quotation marks. Like this is just something that only an ignorant patient would believe. And it's like, again, they're just so out of touch. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. And I wish they, they just be a little bit, should have a little bit more humility and a little bit of interest in sort of rethinking their positions. Yeah. Curiosity is important. Are you, do you offhand know if we're seeing a similar fade away with the uh, American Psychiatric Association in terms of membership? Uh, I do not know. I, I just know about the American Medical Association. I, I, right. I'm not sure. I do know, like I've spoken to tons of psychiatrists about cannabis. They asked me recently to speak um, in New Jersey and I spoke with like 300 psychiatrists and it was really interesting. They specifically said, can you talk about the benefits as well as the harms, because every other lecture we've ever had has just been about the harms. So I talked about the harms, and then I started talking about what I treat people for and, and the benefits. And, you know, grand rounds for doctors is a pretty solemn occasion, you know, and everybody behaves. But 10 minutes before I ended, this elderly psychiatrist cut me off, interrupted me and started barking, everything you're saying is a lie. Everything you're saying isn't true. It was like, the most like profound violation of decor that I've ever seen in my entire life. Then all the younger psychiatrists or some of the younger psychiatrists started defending me. And I got about 10 emails or messages on Twitter. We love your lecture. We're really interested in it. And we're so sorry that he, you know, shouted you down. So I, I, I tend to think that there's a, a, a big difference between some of the younger, many of the younger psychiatrists, like our friend that we talked about earlier before the show, obviously our mutual friend isn't against cannabis at all. And the older psychiatrists that have never been fed anything but the same old nonsense. That's really interesting. And I, I think when we see people lash out like that, it means like we're getting closer and closer to something that's real. <laughs> I agree with you completely. Yeah, I, 100%. Mm-hmm. What, um, it's kind of funny that that group's smart approaches to marijuana now that it's getting, it's losing the legalization battle across the country. Now they're annoying people in the psychedelic space. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to go somewhere. <laughs> Conservation of energy. So, um, I guess in terms of like cannabis as a psychiatric, you know, tool. Um, you know, some people have really negative reactions to cannabis. Some people have really negative reactions to uh, traditional psychiatric meds. Like, how do you like to talk about cannabis as something for somebody's, uh, I don't want to call it mental health anymore. I want to like mental status. I don't know, mental situation. Like, how do you see cannabis being helpful for some people with some psychiatric things going on? Well, I'm a huge believer in harm reduction. 
I mean, I, I, that's my whole career is to try to do the least harmful thing. I mean, anything I give you could cause harm, but I'm trying to help and not harm you. If you have a strep throat and I give you penicillin, you could be one of the one in a thousand people that has an awful reaction to it. And I feel awful, but that's how we treat strep throat. And if we don't know that you have a history to allergy to penicillin. So people are using cannabis for anxiety and depression. Um, it's hard to find a veteran that doesn't believe the cannabis is helpful for PTSD. It's hard to find a psychiatrist who thinks it is helpful for PTSD, but it's hard to find a veteran who thinks it isn't helpful. I've had tremendous success treating anxiety and PTSD in my clinic. Uh, that said, there, there are certain people with, with, with certain psychiatric conditions that really should completely avoid cannabis or or use it with caution at, at, at best. Um, people with a history or family history of psychosis, I've seen this. People with bipolar can be really, really destabilized by cannabis. And it can it doesn't cause schizophrenia, like the prohibitionists say. Like the rates of schizophrenia have been 1% from the 1950s to the 2020s. And the rates of cannabis uses have gone from like the hundreds of thousands to the hundreds of millions worldwide. I mean, like a thousand time increase and the rates of schizophrenia are flat. So it does not cause schizophrenia, um, but it can precipitate schizophrenia earlier in people who are susceptible, say they have a family history of it and they don't know it. And it's a really big deal if you're going to develop schizophrenia at age 20 rather than 26. That's six years you could be developing adult coping, adulting, and, and life skills. Your outcome is just worse. So, you know, just like any other drug or medicine, cannabis can have a very bad reaction. So the key to that is to start low, to go slow, to have very good communication between doctor and patient, which is sorely lacking as we discussed earlier, and to have follow-up and to make sure that things are okay. And if they're not okay, just say, we're not going to use cannabis for your sleep. We'll use something else. So it's just a question of getting it into the open and sort of treating it like other medications, explaining the potential harms, explaining how it's how it helps many patients and and seeing how it goes and having follow up. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. And yeah, I think the schizophrenia thing is really valuable. Thanks for that. I think people should really hold on to that line um, because that's one of the things that I've seen most people lean on when they're against cannabis is, you know, the schizophrenia line. And if the rates have been at 1% forever, Let's lean on that, lean into that figure. In it's my impossible opinion. that there wouldn't be a bump in in the rates of schizophrenia if we're and they're looking everywhere for these slight little slight little increases that prohibitionists and these anti cannabis researchers. But it's literally again, the, the use of cannabis worldwide has gone up a thousand fold and the rates of schizophrenia have been stable. Again, it can destabilize people with schizophrenia or the incipient schizophrenia that you don't know about yet. And the same with, with bipolar. And, and cannabis can cause cannabis-induced psychosis. I mean, amphetamines can, steroids can, alcohol can, psychedelics can. But the, the drug that most commonly causes a drug-induced psychosis is cannabis. So again, you have to use it very judiciously and carefully. And you know, I think that you know, doctors need to be more involved. And it is a little bit of a free-for-all where people go in to a dispensary and they get upsold all this stuff by the bud tender. Not that I, I mean, I love bud tenders, but some of them are under pressure to upsell. And then instead of taking like, if you haven't used it in 40 years, half of a five milligram gummy, they take like a hundred milligram soda and they freak out and it's just a disaster. So I just, I just think with good education and good oversight, people do tend to do a lot better. Agreed. Yeah. Um, there's <sighs> so much there. So much there. Oh, man. I think... Sorry, each of my answers tends to like uh, sort of kindle six different questions. I've always been like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's perfect. So one thing I have been thinking about quite a bit lately is this, this idea of psychosis, drug-induced psychosis. And like, what do we want to... Th how do we want to set up better definitions so we're talking about something helpful? Right. So like if somebody's on psilocybin mushrooms or accidentally eats 100 or 200 milligrams of THC, like that can present for a handful of hours like psychosis, like in the in the medical establishment, is it treated as if it's your first diagnosis of psychosis or like how do we want to think about psychosis versus like a, a situation that might be with you for oh, a while? Absolutely. If you if you take too much cannabis or have a bad reaction to psilocybin or like I give you um 
you know, ambient and you have a bad reaction. That's just like a toxic, uh, delirious reaction to the medication that's short lived. It just lasts for a couple hours. What gets, you know, and it, and it can be scary. It can be traumatic. It, you know, uh, this is why, you know, psychedelics need to use, be used judiciously. People just can't be like chomping them down without thinking about it. You have to be mindful about all this stuff. And why well, I'm a big believer in, in harm reduction, but you know, psychedelics and cannabis and alcohol and steroids and psychostimulants like Adderall can cause a syndrome where you can be, have these psychotic symptoms for days to weeks. Um, is really scary. It's really awful. People get paranoid, they get delusional and you can't talk anybody out of a delusion. I mean, they're just like, they're firmly convinced. And then, you know, um, the worst case is when it actually triggers full blown psychosis, bipolar, schizophrenia, or just a, a psychotic episode that's not necessarily related. And that's really scary and dangerous stuff. And the people end up dealing with these tragic cases, again, are the pediatric or adolescent and young adult psychiatrists. So, you know, you can sort of understand why they're sort of anti-cannabis, but again, you know, not every, it's a minority of people that have these reactions. And I said earlier, no matter what medication I prescribe, if I give you penicillin, you could have a bad reaction. But again, with close communication, you know, with a therapist there or a friend there or a trip sitter there, you know, there, there are ways to make it, you know, it goes back to Norman Zinberg, another fixture of my childhood, set and setting. If you, there are right ways to do these drugs and there are wrong ways to do these drugs. And you could maximize your, your chances of success by doing it the right way, but there are no guarantees. So people have to be, you know, very judicious in how they use them. Agreed. Yeah. Um, Huh. And that circles back to the communication thing. So thanks for that. It's, it's real. Like if we don't have communication, what do we have? Um, I think Robert Anton well, it Wilson. Also, it, also, it also touches on like this debate of like whether psychedelics should be just in a hospital setting, you know, with therapists and a psychiatrist who's monitoring it or whether they should be decriminalized for use in the woods with your friends. Like I've had some of the best experiences of my life have been like, honestly on mushrooms in the woods with my friends. So I'm in favor of that. But at the same time, people have to be educated and know what the right dose is and know and have someone with them. That's especially it's the first time that isn't tripping. And, you know, again, we could do a lot of harm reduction on this. If we, if we get it in the open, if you, if people have to sneak around and do it in the dark, it, it's all, like all drug use is much more dangerous. Right. Do you have a general position on like the criminalization of drugs, broadly speaking, and like criminal oh, penalties I'm for possession? in favor of decriminalizing. I think law enforcement are the absolute wrong people to get involved in the drug realm, like a hundred percent, like Law enforcement should be involved if someone's getting violent or someone's driving when they're impaired. But otherwise, it makes no sense. Drugs are a medical issue. They're a mental health issue. They're sort of now, because of the war on drugs, a social justice issue. And the people that should be involved in drugs are doctors, nurses, social workers, public health people, lawyers, uh, public advocates, uh, recovery coaches, educate people, don't criminalize them. I mean, someone's addicted and then they get criminalized. They have two problems. They have their addiction. They have three, all the things that are underlying their addiction, like they're probably untreated anxiety and depression, their addiction. And then they have to entanglement with the criminal justice system. It literally makes everything worse and it does nothing to deter drug use. I mean, as Michael Pollan's written about and a lot of other people, people have used drugs in every society throughout human history. It's like, you know, in a perfect world, at the end of a hard day, we'd, you know, do yoga, meditate and eat tofu and we wouldn't need anything. But in reality, many of us need something. The only legal option has been alcohol. And now that there's a legal option for cannabis in many places, a lot of people are going to pick cannabis, but you can't just like pretend that people don't use drugs. And a lot of us feel that people have a right to use drugs as long as you're not harming other people or being like grossly irresponsible. Like the kids are the two-year-olds in the middle of the street and you're an asset. Like, you know, as long as you're like grossly responsible and you're not harming anybody, of course you have the right to use drugs. You mentioned Carl Hart. He wrote a lot about this in his book, uh, Drug Use for Grownups, about the, the intrinsic right we have to experiment with our consciousness. And again, law enforcement is the wrong, just the wrong, completely the wrong paradigm uh, for, for drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a trend that I've been kind of discussing and talking about, which is 
um, probably since before the Reagan era, but like decreasing social services and putting that cost onto police, law enforcement generally, um, and like how that has a lot of negative consequences. And uh, oh, absolutely, you know. they're not trained for that. They don't want to deal with this. And you know, our society just needs to have a humane safety net for people. I mean, I work in an inner city clinic as a primary care doctor with some of the poorest of the poor. A lot of them are like undocumented immigrants. And it's like the way our society treats them is just horrible. We need to have a safety net for people. And, and in Massachusetts, there's this good group, Bay Staters, um, that are decriminalizing psychedelic. I'm sure you heard of the city by city. And now psychedelics are decriminalized in six or seven cities. Um, I helped with a, a couple of those cities. Um, you know, in the fall, we're very likely going to have a statewide wide initiative, which I'm supporting and which we're going to I think we're going to easily pass because we're going to just like work and work and work to pass it. But Particularly like psychedelic city, decrim or all dog yeah, decrim? Psychedelic decrim. Yeah, psychedelic okay. decrim. But like, you know, in the, in the, in the cities where psychedelics are decriminalized, the police are offer are, are trained. One good thing is to respond with like compassion and empathy and like, Hey, do you need to go to the ER? Do you need to just go home? Whereas if it's illegal, you get arrested. Who wants to get arrested when you're having a bad trip? How is that going to help your bad trip to get arrested? Um, so I, I agree that we need a much more robust social safety net and this stuff shouldn't be dumped in the police, but it's the involvement of the police in the first place that's causing the problem, which is why we need to decriminalize. I think all of these drugs and tax them and educate people and have safe supply. But particularly psychedelics is if you're having a bad experience, you want a policeman who's going to come and help you and be empathic, not a police man or woman that's going to come and drag you to the, the drunk tank. I mean, it's hard to even imagine how traumatic that would be. Right. And it's not uncommon. I, I think one of the additional sad consequences of this is the overall attitudes towards law enforcement in America continue to slide. Um, when like, how amazing would it be if I, you know, we like people in this scene could trust and be comfortable around law enforcement. Um, I have a really hard time being around law enforcement. There've just been so many racial incidents that are just like, there's no way to, for the, for the police to, to talk their way out of. But at the same time, yeah, I don't know if it's fair. It's hard to say to, to like generalize to all police. You know, I'm sure there are. Oh, certainly. There's amazing police. I know a number of them. It's just my, how do I know? you know, before I get to know them a little bit. Well, you don't. And, you know, I've had a lot of patients over the years that are police and some are like great people. Some are these gentle, friendly people. Some are these sort of bullies and you could just see where the trouble comes from. You know, it's just hard to, it's hard to generalize. But again, the the problem goes back to like law enforcement is just again, the wrong paradigm. Like people take mm-hmm. drugs, they're allowed to experiment with their consciousness. If there's a medical problem, we treat it medically with addiction treatment or whatever else they need. We don't, we don't criminalize them. It just makes every single aspect of this worse. So kind of ready to jump to this next one. I, I would love to chat a little bit about your book, Free Refills and what you oh, uh, sure. accomplished yeah. there. Well, I was, um, you know, in medical school, I, medical was very stressful. I was in a very abusive marriage. I was working a hundred hours a week. I'm not making excuses, but and I didn't, I wasn't like happy and centered and I didn't have a lot of reserve. And that's exactly who, where addiction can, tends to find people when they're vulnerable. I mean, the reason I called it free refills is that as doctors, we have such access to these medications and we have this incredible stress that goes along with being a doctor. So that's why addiction rates are doc, in doctors are higher than the general population. So in medical school, myself and a friend tried Vicodin. She tried it, which is, you know, she's opiate, sort of like Percocet or Oxycodone. She liked it, had fun, and did something, never wanted to do it again or never felt compelled. You know, I, I had done every drug by that point. But when I tried Vicodin, it was my first opiate. I became so euphoric. It's just beyond description. Like all of my problems absolutely disappeared. Like in retrospect, after a lot of punishment and after a lot of soul seeking, my problems didn't disappear. And I wasn't really happy. It was a fake chemical happiness. But I spent the next 10 years of my life trying to feed my addiction. You know, addiction you starts out and you feel great. Then after a couple months, you feel okay. And then for the next years and year and years, you're just trying not to feel horrible and trying not to withdraw. So I was just like, you know, the people who are addicted, there's a myth that they're like these happy hedonists running around. People who are addicted are like the most miserable people on earth. They're, they're like ghosts and they need compassionate treatment. 
So I eventually got busted for bad prescription and the state police and the DA, this is how free refills, my book, Free Refills Starts. It starts with the state police and the DA raiding my office, which I can tell mm. you is not a very fun experience. And it led to a complex sequence of negative consequences, such as me being charged with three felonies, me being on probation. I couldn't leave the state without getting permission from my probation officer. They sent me to this goofy rehab for 90 days. I'm not a believer in rehab at all. It's not a great way to treat people with addiction. You just repeat slogans all over again. I Over and over again, I lost my medical license for three years, but eventually I got it and I got into recovery. And then the thing that helped me was the physician health service. They provide therapy and group support and, and, and they did a lot of drug testing to keep me on the straight and narrow. I have mixed feelings about drug testing. So I got into recovery in about 2009. And in 2013, the same physician health services invited me to help other doctors who are suffering from addiction. So it was such a mind-blowing experience. I sat at the same exact table just on the other side, helping other doctors who, like me, had just overdosed or had the police caught on them or gotten arrested or had a DUI. And I got to help hundreds of doctors with their addiction. So free refills is just my evolution from like, utterly and completely addicted to healthy and off opiates. And I'm a big believer in Cali sober. I mean, I don't make it a huge secret that I'm in favor of using cannabis and psychedelics in in my personal life, you know, judiciously. But, um, you know, I I don't at all believe with the AA and I've written extensively about this, you know, abstinence for life. But certainly I, I try my best to stay away from opiates. You know, it's interesting with my broken leg that I had recently, I had opiates and it was like not a big deal at all. And I think that's because I'm just at a much, much happier phase of my life. There's much less room for like the seductiveness of the opiates to come in because I have a happy life. Right, 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 right. Yeah. I noticed my negative habits. That was a long answer. (laughs) No, I'm into it. I notice, um, you know, when I'm really, really engaged and happy with things, my, you know, quote unquote addictions just seem to fade away into the background. Um, well, absolutely. Yeah. It's about like and being in recovery. Isn't just about not doing your drug of choice. It's about like connecting with other people and, and asking for help. If you need it, asking for a hug, if you need it, talking to people when you're feeling hungry, angry, lonely, tired, all the triggers. And really just, it's about connecting with other people. And, you know, when you're using a ton of drugs like opiates, you know, and I don't include cannabis or psychedelics in this at all, but when you're addicted to opiates, your emotional connection becomes to the drug and it's very, very lonely. So I, I really do agree that addiction is a disease of isolation and that recovery is all about connecting with people. Mm, yeah, I can appreciate that. Um, do you, you're familiar with the rat park story? <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Like I know I there's some a little, over, a little overstated, you know, by, I'm yeah. not going to name any names, but people say, Oh, rat park, you know, the drugs don't, aren't really addictive. It's all about like your social circumstance. I do think your social circumstance is really, really important. But as someone who's taking care of people addicted to meth, addicted to alcohol, worst of all, addicted to opiates, the drugs themselves are really addictive. It is not just about being an unhappy rat park. It has to do with rat park and sort of our brain chemistry. I mean, you know, I've never drank much and uh, I was in a physician support group meeting and one of the other physicians said it at age 14, I had my first drink of alcohol and I never stopped drinking from that moment. And I really had a hard time relating to that. And then I was at a book talk for free refills and I said, and a woman in the question period said, I had, you know, Vicodin for my, after my C-section and it didn't make me euphoric at all. How can you get addicted to that stuff? You know, and it was really interesting. And I told you the first time I tried it, I got really, really, really addicted. So it's a little bit like Russian roulette. Like when you use a highly addictive drug like meth or like alcohol or like, um, an opiate. Uh, some pe- a lot of people can get away with it and they don't get addicted, but for some people, there's an intense biological uh, addiction. And, and, and that's why I'm not entirely, in, I don't I think Rat Park explains like 20% of it, but certainly not a hundred percent of it. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not a hundred percent. And I think there were some, there's some controversy around the research too, generally speaking. So Absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, social support is critical. And, and the sad part is the only social support that's been available is 
AA and NA, which are both sort of like, I mean, I don't begrudge people that do well in them because I have friends that have done well in both of them, but I find them both like incredibly like cult-like and uninviting. And, you know, what was good about my situation is that I had social support from these physician groups. It wasn't religious and it wasn't just repeating these bizarre platitudes from the Alcoholics Anonymous book. And I think that social support is a huge part of recovery from addiction, but we have to provide like normal social support to people, not like these very alienating groups like Alcoholics Anonymous. Right. Is there a model anywhere in the world right now that you appreciate um, relative to what we have today? Well, smart recovery is really good. I've been to smart recovery meetings. You just talk about your problems and talk about your addiction and provide support to each other. And there's not like this ritualized chanting and, you know, again, going on and on and on. One is too many. A thousand is not enough. Abstinence for all the bizarre stuff they do at NA meetings and AA meetings. And they also tend to be a lot more welcoming. Again, I really hate it when someone's on Suboxone and they get criticized at a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. You're not really in addiction in recovery because you're supporting, you're substituting one drug for another. It's like in my hospital, we treat Suboxone for people who are addicted to opiates. Like we treat insulin for people with diabetes. It's a medicine that helps keep you healthy. Uh, you, would have, you wouldn't be able to pick out my patients on Suboxone from any of my other patients. They like look normal. They're back at work. They have happy families. It just helps regulate things. So I, I don't like all the stigma, shame, and judgment. I'm really, that's another one of my pet peeves. And how about like um, from the kind of medical policy slash drug policy perspective? Is there anywhere that you you think is doing that better than, than we are here? Well, I like the Drug Policy Alliance. They had a good way to educate teens about drugs. You know, sort of goes along with what I've always believed, which is like, hey, why not tell them the truth and make yourself a trusted partner so that if they get in trouble, they actually call you. So yeah, I mean, they're definitely, you know, we're seeing a big evolution. I think the war on drugs in certain segments of our population is um, really going out of favor and people are realizing what a complete failure it was to criminalize drug use. And and not just that, you criminalize p- people who use drugs, you stigmatize people with addiction. It's awful. But then you read this this morning, I don't like to be political, but like I, I couldn't help tweeting this article like Donald Trump was calling for like death to drug dealers. Now, like most drug dealers are just people trying to support their habits that desperately need addiction treatment. And I, I, my tweet said, why don't we provide addiction treatment to people? Only 15 to 20% of people, for example, that are addicted to opiates get adequate treatment in this country because we have such a patchwork and frayed social safety net. So instead of like death to drug dealers, why don't we try treating them? Why don't we treat them with empathy and compassion and, and, and give them a pathway out of addiction, you know, sort of like they did in Portugal, though they need to fund it better and take the money away from law enforcement and, 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 and give people housing and job training and education and, and give them a pathway back to a normal life. Most people don't want to be addicted. As, as I mentioned before, if you're addicted, you're one of the most miserable people walking the earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Addiction's brutal. Um, and agreed. Yeah. I was chatting with somebody, uh, that does a lot of kind of disaster relief work. They understand the psychedelic thing quite well. I was having kind of a Carl Hart type conversation with this guy and he just said, we can't trust the data from Portugal. They're not, <laughs> you know, I'm like, what, what do you mean? But, you know, realistically, well, really it's a, not the richest country in Europe. They, they do have to put some extra resources there to make it really perfect, right? No, absolutely. But again, it, it all goes back to like law enforcement, like, just because we've always done something one way doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. And like just getting law enforcement involved, it goes back to prohibition. You know, they, 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 it was huge money. The law enforcement establishment just swelled so massively during prohibition of alcohol. And then they repealed prohibition because it was a disaster. And then you had this huge law enforcement uh, institution. What do you do? You either dismantle it or you find another enemy. I talk a lot about this in Seeing Through the Smoke, and they were like, hey, why don't we stigmatize taint and criminalize cannabis so we could support this huge law enforcement structure? So ever since you know Prohibition, we've just had this criminalization of people using intoxicating substances, and I just think we got really, really off track, and we've never gotten on back on track. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's we're you know, fighting 
decades of well-funded propaganda, criminalization, and much more with relatively unfunded science that needs to get done. Yeah, I'm a I'm a board member over at Psychedelic Medicine Coalition, and we're working to radically increase science funding uh, for for everybody. <laughs> you know, we want this to be at every university and people to be able to fund the studies they want to do. Um, oh, have absolutely. you done any research like this? Well, I'm more of a clinician educator than a researcher, so I don't do a, a ton of research. Um, but you know, we love studies on cannabis to see what it does to your sleep cycle you know, to see if it helps or hurts sleep. I mean, again, to study cannabis for the last 50 years, you had a lower something. You had a lower sperm count, motivation, IQ, none of which are true, by the way, but you had a lower something to get funded. I'm just looking forward to neutral, objective funding. I mean, I, I talk a lot in my book, Seeing Through the Smoke, about the interplay between the science and the social and sort of the, the social um, context. Like with drug funding, you can't dissociate the two because of the war on drugs. And I agree with you. I'm really looking forward to seeing all this, hopefully neutral, you know, no preconceived um, supposition of harm before you do the study. Just like, does this help or does it not help? Really take away the ideology and just start, follow the science. Agreed. Agreed. So um, we're at about time here. Kind of curious if there's anything else you want to mention um, thought wise or about some of your books or writing elsewhere? Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. This is a really great conversation. And I don't know, uh, I, I, I honestly think seeing through the smoke uh, educates people a ton about cannabis. It's a very complicated and interesting topic. And I just have found it so interesting my, my entire life. So I'm very happy to be able to write a book about it. Very honored. Trying to figure out what the next book is, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure it. It'll, it'll come to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, uh, really appreciate your time today. And I, I hope we can do it again in the future. And I uh, hope to visit you uh, next time I'm in Massachusetts. Yeah, if you're in Boston, let's definitely get some coffee. And thank you so much for the great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.